Hello, you're watching Afternoon Live. I'm Martine Croxall. Today at 2. Squeeze on households. Inflation climbs to 3.1%, its highest level in nearly six years. Hundreds of schools remain closed because of the snow and ice across much of the UK. Five people are questioned by police over the suspected murder of three children who died in a house fire in Salford. Coming up on Afternoon Live, all the sport with Ollie Foster and more on the tunnel tussle, Ollie. Absolutely. Well, we've heard from the Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola in the last few minutes. He says their celebrations at Manchester United weren't over the top, but he's not saying what sparked that post-match melee between the players. Ollie, thank you very much. And uh, Darren Bett has all the weather. Teeth were chattering across the country, Darren. How <laughs> cold did it get? Yeah, minus 13 last night. That was actually in uh, Shropshire, where the temperature at the moment is around minus four. So it's uh, risen a little bit, but uh, it's still cold out there. Not as cold tonight as it was last night, but there's still the threat of some icy roads. Darren, thank you. Also coming up, plans for presumed consent for organ donation in England. The radical change is designed to make more organs available for transplant to save more lives. Hello, this is Afternoon Live. I'm Martine Croxall. Inflation is running at its highest rate for nearly six years. It rose to 3.1% last month. The Office for National Statistics says airfares and computer games contributed to the increase and the cost of food was also up. The most recent data shows that average weekly wages are growing at just 2.2%, which means a further squeeze on living standards. Our economics correspondent Andy Verity reports. At this baker on the outskirts of Barnsley, it's not just the bread rolls that are on the rise. It's buns, loaves and mince pies end up in pubs and restaurants from Weatherspoons to Pret to TGI and as far afield as the Middle East and Asia. But ingredients like butter and flour have shot up in the past year and a half, so it's had to do everything it can to make sure its costs are covered. One of the things we've done with our suppliers, we've decided to take a radical approach, which is pay all our suppliers very early and demand better terms from them because we are paying them early and that's helped mitigate some of the costs. If you're looking to warm yourself up in the cold weather, it's not getting any cheaper. The price of food was up by 4.4% in the year to November, hot drinks like coffee, tea and cocoa are up 5.6% and electricity costs more than 11.4% more than it did last year. Very difficult to make ends meet in these days, especially coming up towards Christmas, everything's going up. Money, rent, electricity, gas, telephone, everything's all going. So we need somebody to do something about it. And I see a lot of things going up, maybe a couple of pennies and that. But if you're getting a few things, by the time you get to the cash desk, you say, how did it come to that, you know? It's just one of these things. The fact that inflation is higher than it's been for nearly six years tells you not so much how high it's got as how low it's been for so long. If you look at the last 10 years here, the peak was back in 2011 when it got up just above 5% and inflation was close to zero for a pretty long time a couple of years ago. Now it's gone back up above target. The question is, has it peaked? There may be further pressure on prices coming down the line that could mean inflation doesn't slow down anytime soon. I think it has peaked at 3.1%. It should start to moderate through 2018. The question is, how fast will it fall? Um, some producer price data out today suggests that prices at the factory gate, so those affecting manufacturers, were a bit stronger. Commodity prices, oil price increases, they could be passed through and make inflation a little bit stickier than the Bank of England would be comfortable with. Inflation at 3.1% is above the Bank of England's target range and its governor will soon have to write a letter to the Chancellor explaining why. But because wages aren't rising in response, there's little pressure for a second rise in interest rates any time soon. If your wages buy less than they did last Christmas, though, that's no more than a crumb of comfort. Andy Verity, BBC News. Five people have been questioned over the suspected murder of three children who died in a house fire in Greater Manchester yesterday. 
The blaze broke out in the early hours of the morning. A 14-year-old girl died at the scene. Her seven- and eight-year-old siblings died later in hospital. The children's 35-year-old mother is in a serious condition, along with her three-year-old daughter. And our correspondent Danny Savage is in Worsley for us. Uh, Danny, tell us uh, how this investigation is progressing. Well, we're a day and a half after this fire now, and this is now a major crime scene. You can see behind me a hydraulic platform outside the house, which was, uh, we believe, deliberately set fire to in the early hours of yesterday morning at about 5 a.m. It's the middle house of a terrace of three. You can see its windows have been burnt out, and they, the forensics officers on that hydraulic platform have been paying close attention to the chimney, the scaffolding, which was there before the fire, uh, to see if there's any anything to do with helping them with the investigation but this is a, a huge investigation lots of officers involved we know there was extra security on the home there because of some past incidents and that will no doubt form part of the wider inquiry the police are doing at the moment Jackson Street in Walkden is still cordoned off today police guard a family home that was set alight early yesterday morning killing three children more details have emerged about the young brothers and sisters who died here. The oldest victim was 14-year-old Demi Pearson, who died at the scene. Neighbours have been left heartbroken after watching her 7-year-old sister Lacey and 8-year-old brother Brandon being carried from the house by firefighters. They both died later in hospital. Their 35-year-old mother, Michelle Pearson, is in a serious condition, along with a fourth sibling, three-year-old Leah, who is described as critical. The deaths of three children is heartbreaking. Our thoughts are with the family, the little girl and her mum, who are fighting for their lives. Our specially trained officers are now with the family to help them through this devastating time. Police also confirmed there had been earlier incidents at the family home and said the force had made a self-referral to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. It's understood the voluntary referral was in response to police contact with the family less than 24 hours before the fatal fire. A number of arrests were made yesterday evening. This video, filmed by a resident, shows suspects being detained. The majority of those in custody are under arrest on suspicion of murder. Just to give you some more detail on the people who are under arrest at the moment, three men aged 23, 20 and 18, along with a 20-year-old woman, are a bit arrested on suspicion of murder. Another man aged 24 is being, is being questioned on suspicion of assisting an offender. So five people in custody at the moment. Lots of people coming to leave flowers here. Uh, lots of people deeply upset, understandably, about what's happened as well. A Just Giving page has been set up locally to help the family family too uh, and I was just talking to one friend of the family and he said it's the, the hardest thing is trying to explain to other children living in this neighborhood what happens awful enough for children to die in a house fire absolutely terrible for it to happen when the understanding is that this fire was started deliberately but a big investigation still ongoing here in the Walkden area of Greater Manchester Danny thank you very much Danny Savage uh, some breaking news now we have uh, News of agreement between the Brexit Secretary David Davis and the European Parliament's negotiator uh, Guy Verhofstadt. Uh, there'd been a bit of concern about the uh, nature of the deal that was struck last week, which should lead on to talks about trade. Uh, Guy Verhofstadt had said it was unacceptable that it was only regarded as a statement of intent or a gentleman's agreement. However, the two men have now said that they agree it's important to turn this deal into a legally binding document, turning that joint report into a legal text as soon as possible. David Davis has taken to social media, as is the way. Pleasure as ever to speak to my friend Giva Hofstadt. We both agreed on the importance of the joint report. Let's work together to get it converted into a legal text as soon as possible. We will be hearing from our chief political correspondent, uh, Vicky Young very shortly about uh, EU citizens' rights, but we'll also uh, talk to her about uh, that agreement between those, the uh, Brexit Secretary and Guy Verhofstadt today. Hundreds of schools have remained closed today because of the snow and ice across much of the UK. Drivers and commuters have faced difficult journeys today following the coldest nights of the year. 
Well, our correspondent Joanne Rittle is in Shawbury, where the temperature overnight fell to minus 13. That is cold by anybody's standards, Joanne. It was the coldest place officially in the whole of the UK. It's warmed up to a positively tropical minus four now. I'm joined now by the appropriately named Met Officer James Rainbow. So, James, tell me, how do you record these temperatures? So we have some temperature sensors in the, our instrument enclosure behind us on, on the airfield, and they're constantly recording the temperature 24-7 throughout, and they recorded minus 13 at 10 past five this morning when the office was closed. And where do you get such freezing temperatures here on this airfield? Because of our sort of geography, our location, we're well inland, we're in a, a big bowl with hills all around us, and because of the sandy soil, it's a very cold place, and obviously the snow last night on the ground made it even colder. So it was minus 13 overnight, about five in the morning, but what's the coldest temperature you've ever recorded here in Shawbury in Shropshire? So back in December 1981, we were minus 25.2. Not quite the coldest place ever in England, but not far off. Goodness me. Well, just over here across the airfield is uh, Group Commander Rob Norris, the station commander here. So, Rob, tell me, how is this icy weather affecting operations here? Because this is a main sort of military training base, isn't it? It is, yes. It's the home of the Defence Helicopter Flying School that trains helicopter pilots for all three services. As you can see, um, I've got no helicopters outside today because this is pretty advanced conditions for our students. And this is more that they would do on the front line when they've got their wings away from here. So we're looking after the safety of our crews and making sure that they can crawl before they run. But air traffic control is still up and running, isn't it? You can see the tower just over there, over the way. Yes, yes they are. Um, we are still providing a, a lower airspace radar service for uh, under contract to the CAA, so uh, that's trying to keep uh, Shropshire's sky safe, even though we're not using the runway today. And have you been called upon to help out members of the community in this terrible weather? Uh, I think we've all mucked in together. We have no specific cause for, for help, but you know we're, we're ready to stand by if anybody needs any help. But, but Shropshire Council have been doing a really good job up to now. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Well, uh, they measured 18 centimetres of snow here in Shawbury yesterday. As I said, temperatures have risen from minus 13 to uh, uh, a chilly minus four now. They're expected to rise a little further to minus two a little later too. Joanne, thank you very much. Joanne Rittle in Shropshire. I'm very pleased to see you appropriately dressed. We can't have you getting cold out there. Now, the owner of a dog that attacked 12 children in a playground in Northumberland has been jailed for four years. Claire Neal Staffordshire Bull Terrier attacked the children in a public play area in Blythe last May. The youngest victim was six. Some needed skin grafts and stitches. Claire Neal admitted owning a dog that was dangerously out of control. The government is to introduce a new and simpler system for EU citizens applying for the right to live in the UK permanently. Ministers have accepted that the present process is deeply flawed and aim to replace it with a quick online system. There's been widespread criticism of the application procedure. The Immigration Minister Brandon Lewis today has said that the system was overly complicated and overly bureaucratic. Well, our Chief Political Correspondent Vicky Young has been following this from Westminster and she joins us now. Vicky. Yeah, and another big week, of course, when it comes to all things Brexit and EU, with that EU withdrawal bill going through uh, the House of Commons again this week. But this is a slightly separate issue, but one that, of course, potentially affects millions of people, millions of EU citizens who have come to this country over the years, who will now have to uh, register to get settled status. And the big question is whether the system can cope. I'm joined now by the Labour backbencher, Alison uh, McGovern, to talk about all of this. Um, do you think the system will be able to cope? Because it could be an awful lot of people, some already trying to do it and some in the future who will want to register. That's right. There's three million roughly uh, EU nationals in this country. So we're talking big numbers here. Um, I think what Brandon Lewis has said today is welcome if it's an acknowledgement that the Home Office has basically failed people in the past because we've had a really bureaucratic system. But I would question whether the amount of staff that we've got to deal with this is enough and I think at the heart of this is trust. I think we've had a really negative atmosphere uh, for EU nationals in this country for far too long and I think the government have got much further to go to be rebuild trust on the issue of EU nationals in the UK. Well, Theresa May yesterday did write an open letter to EU citizens saying that she thought our country would be poorer without them, that she wants all of them to stay. I suppose there is a question about how much they're going to have to pay to register through this new system, whether they'll have to pay anything and whether it's true that, as the government says, it will only take seconds to do it online. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, Theresa May, if, if that's what she's saying now, you know, she's right. I agree with her. People are welcome here. 
and add a tremendous amount to our country, but it's against the backdrop that she created in the Home Office as Home Secretary, where they wanted to create an atmosphere that was unwelcome for immigrants in this country. Well, actually, I think we've seen the cost of that now, and I would just say, I think we've got a lot further to go as a country to set people's minds at rest and to be seen as the open and, and uh, outward-looking country that I think Britain really is. I was going to ask you about that, about EU citizens in your constituency. How have they felt since that Brexit vote? Are they now reassured, given we have got that first stage of the deal, which does uh, settle uh, their future in this country? I think we've got a long way to go on reassurance, if I'm honest. I've, you know, there's people in my constituency who um, are EU nationals who've been in this country longer than I've been alive, who felt that their position has been undermined. So we've really got a long way to go. If this is a small step from the government today, that's a good thing. But I would say, you know, we've had broken promises from the Home Office before about systems being easy to use. And we're going to need some commitment to keep coming back to Parliament on this issue so that we can hold the government to account on whether they're putting EU nationals, you know, through a really difficult situation. Uh, just to broaden it, we were just hearing earlier about this tweet from David Davis in response to Giva Hofstadt uh, about the legality of the deal that was done last week, where David David Davis seemed to imply it was you know, a gentleman's agreement, it wouldn't have legal status. He now seems to be saying that it will be uh, made into some kind of uh, legal document, presumably, which would have to go through this place. Do you welcome that? Well, we just don't know what it means. Um, you know, it's good that the government took a step forward, although it, actually on the issue of the Irish border, they've basically postponed the difficult uh, disagreement between uh, the DUP and uh, all of those who don't want to see a border on the island of Ireland. The issue that we have is this, you know, Michael Gove writing articles about maybe it can all be undone, and now David Davis's intervention. None of this helps us get a deal, because all of this undermines confidence in the British government, and that is not what we want at all. Okay. Alison McGovern, thank you very much indeed. As I say, that bill is still going through Parliament. There will be votes later today, and then crucially tomorrow, there looks likely to be a vote on whether MPs get what they call a meaningful vote at the end of this process, if and when a deal is done. Vicky, thank you very much. Vicky Young, our Chief Political Correspondent in Westminster. You're watching Afternoon Live. These are our headlines. Inflation has increased to its highest level in nearly six years. The consumer prices index rising to 3.1%. Hundreds of schools remain closed because of the snow and ice across much of the UK. Five people are being questioned by police over the suspected murder of three children who died in a house fire in Salford. In sport, the Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola says their celebrations at Manchester United on Sunday weren't over the top. They won 2-1, but a melee involving several players broke out near the dressing rooms and the FA have asked for both clubs to give their observations. England's cricketers are preparing for tomorrow night's third test. They can't afford to lose it. Alistair Cook says the media have overblown some of the off-field disciplinary issues. And the longest-serving director of rugby in the Premiership, Jim Mallander, has been sacked by Northampton Saints after 10 years at the club. I'm going to be back with a full update in the next 15 minutes, and uh, I'll let you know what Jose Mourinho has to say about that tunnel bust-up. Plans to change the rules in England on using people's organs after they die are being set out by the government. The Health Secretary has launched a consultation on moving to a system of what's called presumed consent, in which people opt out of being a donor rather than opting in. It's already been introduced in Wales. Scotland is planning to follow suit. Our health correspondent Dominic Hughes reports. Offering a stranger the gift of life is what lies at the heart of organ donation. These are the names of those who've helped some of the 6,500 people who need a transplant each year, but around 450 will die before a donor can be found. The family of Adrian Williams were happy to support his decision to donate. When you lose someone and they've given that gift, that huge gift, you are immensely proud of them and it fills you with comfort that other families are actually enjoying the lives of their loved ones where they may not have done because of something that our aid has done for them. The past decade has seen a big surge in donors across the UK. In 2007, there were around 790 deceased donors. That's now risen to more than 1,400. The number of registered donors has also gone up from 14 million to more than 23 million. 
but ministers are concerned that four out of ten families still say no to donation, so are proposing a system where it's assumed we're all willing to be donors. The issue of presumed consent is one of the things we're looking at. What we need really is to have much better communication inside families so that people know what their family members actually want. The story of transplants in the UK over the past decade has been one of success. More people are having operations and more people are willing to donate their organs. But there are those who worry that if we move to a system of presumed consent, well, that could actually do more harm than good. It's a quick fix for politicians. You pass a law, automatically everyone is presumed to be a donor and you've got more organs. But in real life, it doesn't happen that way. A lot of people who uh, would potentially become organ donors object to it so strongly that they join the opt-out register. Organ donors give strangers the gift of life, but opinion is split on whether presumed consent is the way to encourage more to make this final selfless act. Dominic Hughes, BBC News. Well, here on Afternoon Live after 2.30, we'll be speaking to the Chief Medical Officer for Wales, where there is already a presumed consent scheme for organ donation in place. Voters are going to the polls in the US state of Alabama, normally a safe Republican seat in what's been a hard-fought race for the US Senate. Donald Trump has publicly endorsed the Republican candidate, a former judge whose campaign has been clouded by allegations of sexual misconduct towards teenagers. His Democratic rival is a former lawyer known for prosecuting white supremacists. Gary O'Donoghue reports from Alabama. Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore, why won't you answer? Mr. Moore, why won't you answer any questions, sir? What would you tell your accusers? What would you tell them? A month ago, Roy Moore looked dead and buried accused by eight women of sexual assault and harassment, including one who was 14 at the time. Even the staunchest of Republicans had deserted him. But now this hugely controversial figure is ahead in this the polls, just and defiant in the face of many who said he should have stepped down. We're Alabama. We're Republican. And we're not going to stand by and let other people from out of state and money from California control this election. Wow! Alabama hasn't elected a Democrat as senator for more than a quarter of a century. And the fact that Doug Jones is still in the running shows just how unpredictable this race has become. We say no more to discriminating against those that have, are the least fortunate among us. It's just time, folks, that we say no more. We all got stuck with. Thank you. Very Donald much. Trump has also faced allegations of sexual harassment, and for several weeks he declined to publicly back the Republican candidate in Alabama. But eventually he overcame his reticence. I think he's going to do very well. We don't want to have a liberal Democrat in Alabama, believe me. In Alabama's capital, these Democrat voters thought exactly the same, but about the other guy. I think that in any situation when you're doing a job and you get accused of heinous acts, um, you have to answer to that. And for some reason, when you're a politician, you can kind of sweep it under the rug. I think it will be um, an embarrassment to the state. Um, I think he will be ineffective if, he, if uh, Moore is elected uh, when he gets to the Senate, that uh, uh, he's going to be probably shunned by many. We don't want somebody in there that uh, has been accused of molesting kids because kids are uh, our next step for our future. This race is about much more than a seat in the United States Senate. If the Republicans lose, then Donald Trump will find it even harder to get his program through Congress. If Roy Moore wins, then he'll face months of investigation by an ethics committee. And Alabama could end up doing this all over again in just a few months' time. Gary O'Donoghue reporting. The French President Emmanuel Macron says he believes President Trump will bring the US back into the Paris deal on combating climate change. Earlier this year, Donald Trump announced he would pull the United States out of the global pact on emissions that had been signed by Barack Obama. Speaking ahead of a new climate summit in Paris, President Macron condemned America's decision to withdraw from the deal. The US did sign the Paris Agreement. It's extremely aggressive to decide on its own just to leave and no way to push the others to renegotiate because one decided to leave the, the floor. I'm sorry to say that. 
it doesn't fly. So, sorry, but I think it's a big responsibility in front of the history, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that my friend President Trump will change his mind in the coming month or years. The French President Emmanuel Macron. Strong winds are still fanning the wildfires that have been burning in large parts of Southern California for more than a week. Vast areas have been destroyed and hundreds of thousands of people have been moved from their homes. Firefighters have been working around the clock to tackle one of the largest wildfires ever to hit the state. Our North America correspondent James Cook has the latest on what's becoming an environmental and economic disaster. This fire is a monster. It has now burned an area bigger than New York City and Paris combined. More than 6,000 firefighters are battling it, but still the blaze rages in the hills above the Pacific Ocean. Well, these helicopter pilots are working hard, trying to slow down the northward advance of this huge fire. But still it is marching on, down from that ridge top, and the concern is that it might affect homes here, and it could even burn all the way down towards Santa Barbara on the Pacific Ocean. California feels like a state under siege by the climate. Rising temperatures, years of drought, longer and more devastating wildfire seasons. The governor says in this warming world, it's no surprise. This could be something that happens every year or every few years. It happens to some degree. It's just more intense, more widespread, and we're about ready to have uh, firefighting uh, at Christmas. Uh, this is very uh, odd and unusual, but it is the way the world is. On the lettuce line, they're carrying on as best they can. Inside the greenhouse, they've had to install a fan to blow ash off the leaves. 150 people work here. Many are worried about their homes and about the local economy. The whole community is going to going to suffer you know yesterday all, all the restaurants are closed and you know normally everything's bustling on a on a Sunday evening so it's going to be tough for everybody Easy, guys. it's been a distressing Easy, week for animals Easy. too Easy. dozens of horses Easy. have died in the fires this video shows racehorses fleeing the flames after they were set loose in San Diego County there is some good news. The worst winds seem to have died down, giving firefighters a better chance to battle the blaze. But it is a daunting task. This may yet become the largest wildfire in the history of this state. James Cook, BBC News, Santa Barbara County in California. 27 minutes past two. The recent heavy snow may have encouraged some people to get building snowmen. But one man has taken his snow sculpting a step further. This is the igloo Benjamin Crutch built in his girlfriend's garden in Redditch in Worcestershire after heavy snow on Sunday. The igloo took eight hours to build using nearly 500 snow bricks. It looks immensely welcoming, doesn't it? People pay good money to stay in things like that. Should start charging. Oh, it's already got some residents. Look, look at that. Lovely, pretty. Well, let's see if there's going to be much more snow to challenge that. That's an amazing effort, wasn't it? The igloo is, uh, is still there. Is it's, it? It's still freezing in Worcestershire, I suspect, right now. It's, uh, it's taken a while to warm up, certainly. It looks so beautiful. But yeah. th that pink sky was this yeah. morning. Yeah, that was this morning. This was actually a weather watcher picture taken by a brave weather watcher in Shropshire. And it was in Shropshire that we had the lowest temperatures this morning. Minus 13. This is not a record, but it's the uh, coldest we've had it all year. So minus 13. Just beating what we had the night before, of course, by about... 0.2 of a degree. All that matters, though, if you're trying to set It is. Records. It's important. Uh, th th what is it going to be like, though, in the next sort of few days? Is it going to get any any warmer? Well, first of all, I was hoping you were going to ask me where where how cold it has been. And I was going to ask you how cold it's no, ever been. No, you were going to ask me. Yes, indeed. We should plan this, shouldn't we? Sorry. What we were going to do... Yes. Which so, camera are we on, Happy? Let's forget. It's fine, it's fine, it's no, fine. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> what we were going to do... <laughs> is Darren was going to ask me what's the lowest temperature in the country and where was it? He's off script, I'll not me. You, what, you could ask me that question then. Darren? Because I know the answer. <laughs> Darren, where has the coldest temperature been recorded? The lowest temperature ever recorded in the UK <laughs> was twen minus 27. I was going to say minus 25. Minus 27.2. 
And this was at Braemar in January 1982 and Altnahar again in Scotland in December 1995. So if you think minus 13 is cold, minus 27, you know 2 is even colder. I was going to say minus yeah. 25 in Glencoe. Were you? So I wasn't far off. No, you weren't far off. No, we've gone off piece, that now. apparently. You say that now because you've seen the answer. No, that's not true. I could have shown you. I'd written it in an envelope. <laughs> um, so now I'll ask you, yes. shall I, what's well, it going to do tonight? it's not going to be as cold tonight. Thank you. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> but we still this have... This is the rehearsal, you know, yeah, we get uh, it right next we'll, hour. Yeah, a couple of hours will be all right. Uh, but it's, uh, we, we're seeing things changing, really, because this is County Down in Northern Ireland and there's more cloud coming in here and we've actually seen a bit of rain and that wetter weather is coming into the cold air that we've got across the UK from this cloud here. And as it hits the cold air, there's the risk of snow but there's also the risk of ice as well, and that's going to be the uh, biggest problem, I think, overnight and as we head into tomorrow. Let's move things on a little bit. This wetter weather is leaving Northern Ireland over the next few hours. This is six o'clock this evening, and we've got some wet weather in Scotland, but it's not just rain, it's snow. That's snow falling over the hills mainly, briefly, and a similar story, really, I think, across Northern England. Some snow just for a short while over the Pennines, into the Peak District and over the Cumbrian Fells. But across Wales and southwest, it's mostly going to be rain, because the temperatures will be rising a little bit here. But we've still got cold air ahead of that, increasing clouds, so we're losing the sunshine. And uh, we've got this risk of ice then in many areas of the UK. You can see how that wet weather pushes its way through, and it will be mostly rain across the eastern side of England. That moves away. We get some more showers arriving in the west, but in between, those temperatures dip away, close to freezing if the cloud breaks, and that brings the risk again of some icy stretches and probably the biggest risk of disruption will be across northern England and also in Scotland. Mind you, as we know in Wales and the Midlands there's plenty of lying snow and that hasn't really thawed a great deal today. We've got more rain though coming eastwards during tomorrow. That rain could be quite heavy in the morning and then it brightens up. We get some sunshine, we get some showers and those showers start to turn wintry again in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here, temperatures probably around four or five degrees in the afternoon. Uh, across southern parts of England and Wales, you may get up to nine or ten briefly. But we've got to keep an eye on what's developing in Northern Ireland and Scotland because we may well see some snow, some fresh snow at lower levels, pushing across Wales, Midlands, Northern England tomorrow evening. And then that moves through. The winds start to pick up as we move into Thursday. Broadly speaking, it's a mixture of sunshine and showers. Those showers could be quite wintry, more likely to have snow over the hills. Uh, temperatures, though, beginning to drop away. Three degrees in the central belt, seven degrees this time across southern areas of England and Wales. And as we move into the end of the week, look what happens. We get the isobars going all the way up to the Arctic, the winds coming all the way down from the Arctic on Friday. Not as cold as it has been just recently by any means, but it just continues this risk of snow and also the risk of ice. <laughs>